So everybody, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming for my talk about flow streams and how not to drown with your data. Uh, I guess some people st still are coming, but nevertheless, we, we will start because I guess I'm the only thing that separates you from the lunch. So I'll try to be a, a bit brief, <laughs> but we'll see how, how it goes along. Okay, so, so at first, just a word about me. I'm, my name is Maciek Prochniak. I work in small, or maybe not so small, like 80, 90 person uh, software house in Warsaw. It's called Tog. This is this is our logo, and we are based company based mostly on developers. We don't have sales, we don't have HR, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, I'm doing mostly with integration stuff with Apache Camel, various USB SOAs, and so on. But I used to be doing something totally different. I used to be kind of algebraic topologist. I used to be computing cohomology whole limits and so on and so forth. I used to be pursuing my PhD, but this is not the case. <laughs> yeah, I'm a software developer now. And today, what we'll be talking about? We'll be talking about data house. The data flows into our application faster and faster and faster. We cannot, we, we, we are struggling to deal with it, but we are Sometimes we are failing miserably, and sometimes not. And today we're going to, to see at some of the problems that may arise and some of the solutions. Some, are, some will be simple, some will be more complex. We'll see along the way. OK, so at first I would like to, to tell a little bit about the setup, what data I'm talking about. My company works mostly for, for Polish clients, so we're not talking about kind of internet scale, such as companies from, from Ukraine, like Epan Logica, and, and so on. So our companies are mostly telcos, but also biggest Polish uh, auction platforms. Uh, in Ukraine, I think it's called Aukro. In Poland, it's called Allegro. So we have like 10, 20, 30 million customers. They are doing real-time binding auctions. So they generate like 20,000 events per second more. but. Moreover, they, they, there's a clickstream, right? They go through, through, through various items on auctions, uh, on online shopping, and they generate, generate, generate. And what we try to do with it? Well, we use it for order protest processing to, to see, to see w which auction wins, which loses, and so on. But more complex, mm, complex problem is recommendation engine. Right, this is this is <laughs> where where the real money is. And there are complex problems, complex algorithms there, incremental data protest processing, and so on. And this is where the state is. This is where we handle all those events and try to do something about it. And our second, I think, this is our biggest um, area of interest. Our our largest clients are telco companies. Like in Poland, we have like 40 million people, so. Large telco companies have like 10, 20 million of subscribers. And what they do? They phone, right? They, they're making calls. And what do they generate? Well, essentially, they generate billing data. This can take various forms like CDR, MTRs, and so on. From 5,000 per sec, that's quite modest, modest amount, to 20, 30,000 per sec. And what we are trying to do with them, well, one of the hmm, one of the approaches is to try to propose some next best action uh, that they can take. For example, you are running out of money on your account. We propose, please buy this packet. You you have some problems with connection. Please contact our support line. We noticed that you contacted with our with, with our other telco vendors. Then please don't go away. Stay with us. And all of this has to be done more or less like real time. But there is also another, mm, another area of interest that is detecting frauds. It also has to be done in mostly more or less real time. And this is, this is pretty stateful problem because usually it doesn't take just one call, one billing event to, for us to, to say this is a fraud. It, it's more a pro problem like in the, last hour or last two hours, this client made like 20 calls to, to, to various can Caribbean islands and that will charge him like, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 euros of lotus and so on. So we have to consider the events in, in some certain amount of time. But there's even bigger, mm, bigger 
source of events, and that's a signal data. This is a real data host because each time you make a call, events are flying constantly from your phone to, to all those transmitting stations, and they can, that's quite a huge amount of data, in, even in not so large company like, like Polish One, that's like more than one million per second. And what you can do with them? Well, you can use them for tracking where the customer is, what is he doing, is his signal right, and so on. And for example, to spam him with greatly targeted uh, advertisements, right? For example, you know that he's walking by some retail store, and you can send him SMS, please go and have a coffee, and so on and so forth. So these are the, uh, the, the ways we can use the data. And of course, we cannot use all of our normal tools to, to, to handle them, right? This is the slide that I <laughs> found Googling randomly on, on the internet to see what can be associated with data house. And it turns out that SQL Server has a mode that's called Firehose mode. And of course, you cannot do transactions with them. And it's the same situation with all the frameworks, libraries that I use to process these data. So what do we have instead? Well, today I want to talk a little bit about tasks that, that may arise, what we can do with this, all those data, what are problems specific for, for these types of streaming solutions, what are these solutions about frameworks, and two or three frameworks and, uh, frameworks and libraries that can help us to, to deal with them, and how to choose. What are the choices? How should we make it? So first about things that we can do with our streams of data. First, we'll talk about really simple things. And the simple things are, the simplest one is filtering data, right? It's so obvious, but sometimes it's more than enough to, to handle all this data. For example, I was talking about the signal data, and our client told us some time ago that, okay, we have like 70 terabytes uh, of data per day, but all we want to do in the first step is just filter clients that are agreed to be spammed by us. And that will leave like 10% of that, so we can handle them. So this is all about raw, raw speed of filtering. How fast, how fast can we ingest? How fast can we filter? The other thing is mapping, right? Mapping data, we have one, one event, and we want to compute something and reach it in, for example, we have message from some click stream, and we want to in, enrich it in with, with some user data. And this is also pretty trivial, but at set, certain volume, it ceased to be so trivial, because, for example, at, at the speed like 200,000 events per sec, it's no longer viable just to go to the database and fetch user data. So you have to have some certain specially crafted solutions for that. But this is where things get more interesting, because the next operation that you can do on certain streams of data is joining them. Imagine that this below, on, on, down, there's a stream of messages, for example, for, for, from Twitter. And from the, the above, there's the other stream of um, user data coming from, from, for example, some user service. And what do we want to do? We want to enrich the click stream or tweet stream with user data. Yeah, I guess it's not visible <laughs> anymore. Uh, so this is this is more difficult operation because this is a stateful operation, right? This stream is going, 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 and this is our stream framework operator or whatever. And here we have to pre-compute the the user data. We have to store it some somehow, somewhere, somewhat. And here just we match match the user with uh, with appropriate tweet, right? So this is first example of stateful operation. What about the other one? Well, this is reduced, right? We've, talk we've been talking about map, filter. Now, of course, it's reduced, right? We have some certain streams of tweets or whatever. And then we probably want to group it by, by some key. It could be user ID. It could be Twitter hashtag or whatever. Compute some partial sums and emit the results, right? So again, this is the crucial step here is how do we handle the state? How do, you ha how do we handle it accurately and, and fast enough, of course? And when we talk about emitting aggregated data, well, there's the last and most difficult thing that we can consider that we can uh, do, do, do with our streams, that are windows. Windows are a pretty complex subject, and we will touch it just very, very briefly. How, 
What's the problem of Windows? The problem is that when we aggregate data, we want to aggregate in certain batches. Sometimes the batches can be like mm, per count, like 10 tweets. Each 10 tweets, we, we, we aggregate it and emit some partial results. But most common and more difficult mm, way of grouping events in Windows is by time. For example, we want to group messages from last 10 seconds and emit one batch. We want to aggregate messages from next 10 seconds and emit another batch, and so on. And this is the mm, easiest stuff, but more complex stuff is grouping by sliding windows. For example, this is mostly used, for example, with fraud detection, right? We want to detect that client, mm, that client made some suspicious call, uh, calls in, in the period of one hour. So we can't just say the hour is from midnight to 1 a.m., from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. But this uh, period of suspicious calls can just last from 1 a.m. 20 to, 1 a to 2 a.m. 20. And it's, again, it's an hour, but it's sliding. So each of the events can belong to many, many sliding windows. And this is, this is surprisingly hard problem that only some frameworks can deal with. OK, we've been talking. We went through various operations that we'll be doing on streams. But where do these streams come from? And here, here we'll be using Kafka. In my stream talks, I won't, uh, I won't be setting any standards. I don't believe there are any standards for stream processing so far. But Kafka is, I think, is more or less de facto standard for handling such, uh, such data. How many of you are? using Kafka in production or development or whatever. Yeah, quite a few people, but still, still not everybody. But uh, <laughs> I think this number will be larger and larger. So what's Kafka all about? Just, just to sum up, Kafka, is, Kafka Broker has a collection of topics. And what is Kafka topic? It's a sharded right ahead log. And in fact, it's usually advertised as a messaging system, but in my opinion, the way of describing it as sharded right ahead log is kind of better. Replicated, sharded, right ahead log. And in fact, all the words in this description are pretty meaningful. It's important for applications that this log is sharded, that it can be partitioned by, by key that you want. In fact, in newer Kafka versions, it, it can also know not only the key that is partitioned by, but also the timestamp when the message was generated. And also, that is log, right? It's not messaging broker like JMS. The producer just writes, 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 and nobody cares if some, someone, is want, someone wants to consume or not. The messages just stay there, well, until we run out of disk space, right? <laughs> of course, there are some compaction mechanism, retention mechanism, quite, quite elaborate, especially in the newer Kafka versions. But what is more important for the cons consumers is that it's kind of restful API for the consumer. The consumer has full control how it handles the position in the log that it wants to read, right? For example, in JMS, when the consumer reads the message and, for example, the transaction is, uh, is committed, then the message is gone for this consumer. But here, it's different. The consumer can write, 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 write in some replicated data store like, uh, like Zookeeper, or in Kafka itself in the newer versions, that, OK, I, s I ended up here. But if it wants, for example, for some recomputation purposes or, 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 or some mm, failure handling, it can start from, from this point or this point, wherever it wants. And the broker doesn't have to know anything about it. Of course, it has to start from the point when, where the data is not already mm, deleted, right? for retention purposes. But this is very different. This is, this is a very important thing. So how do you access Kafka? There are a few ways, actually. One is Kafka Consumer API. This is really simple and powerful stuff. The, another way is to build kind of fully fledged message broker on top of that. And one example is Allegro Hermes. I'm mentioning it because, well, I was involved in creating that. So check it out. It's, it's, it's pretty powerful. It has REST API. REST APIs for everything. Another way is to use 
standard integration platform like Apache Camel, Camel and I do believe that today we, we will have talk about how to integrate Kafka with Apache Camel or use another, uh, another framework for reactive processing like Akka, where you also have nice libraries for reacting processing messages. But the thing is that all of these solutions are pretty generic. And for, for our purposes, we want to deal with certain class of problems that may arise. So these problems are raw performance, how, how our processing guarantees are satisfied, how to handle state, and how to handle large and uh, complex batches and scenarios. So going through first through performance. Why is it not always viable to, to use generic frameworks? Because, for example, when you take Apache Camel, I suspect it won't handle the load that is needed to, to, to process, for example, 500,000 messages per sec. If you look how Camel handles uh, serialization, partitioning, and so on, it just won't do. So, is it working? Yeah. So, the first trade-off that you can take, and it's usually taken, for example, as, as Taras described in his talk, is trade-off between throughput and latency, right? This is the latency effective uh, way of, uh, of traveling, right? And the Concorde flies pretty fast, but it cannot handle too much passengers. And here there's Jumbo or A380. It can handle many passengers, but not so many, uh, but it flies slowly. So you can have micro-batching framework that groups 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 uh, groups events and emits it like every five or ten seconds or you can hand you can hand straightforward processing when latency can reach five ten or milliseconds not seconds of course this is much uh, harder to create much harder to maintain but there are certain frameworks that can do this and there are, if you want to d go real fast with events then you have certain class of problems that are very easy to get wrong, starting from parsing through me memory management with garbage collection problems and so on, with shuffling partitioning, if you distribute your algorithm, how the data flow, with serialization. Serialization is tricky business because many frameworks rely on reflection and so on. How do you handle re enrichment from local state or, or from some kind of database? So there are many things that can go wrong. And using a framework that can handle that can help. And from the, hmm, from the problem of how fast are we moving, we can move to problem of state. Where do we store state? In normal application, you, you would handle state by storing it some, in some remote store like database, QValue, data store, and so on. But you can go only so far away with that. So for most even processing frameworks, streaming frameworks, the state is handled locally at the same place where, where you store, uh, where you store, where, where you process data. So there are certain problems with that. How do you scale it? How do you move the data from if it's stored locally or in memory? And how you deal with resilience? So where do you actually store it? It turns out it's, you can go pretty far by storing the, the state just, just in memory, in RAM, right? Currently, Amazon has like instances, I think, like with two terabytes of RAM, so we can store very, very man, much many objects there. And in fact, if you stick like 10, 20 gigabytes of, of data into, into heap in some big hash map, you can get away with it. And from time to time, you can just serialize the whole thing to, to some di distributed store like HDFS for for uh, for for doing repartitioning or handling failures and so on, but once you reach certain threshold, you probably want to store it somewhere somewhere else. And one good example of storing this data is RocksDB. This is a pretty new kind of key value store from Facebook. It stores data locally on your on your disk, and it's optimized for fast sequential writes and reads. And what you do with that from time to time. Again, it's not full-fledged database, it's just, it's just local store. And from time to time, you just snapshot the whole way to HDFS so you can access it later. But what happens if you're nice 
aggregation engine crashes. This may happen when you compute your aggregate. You reach level six here. And what happens when it crashes and you want to, 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 to get back? So probably you, you remember in your Kafka that here you stopped uh, reading at, at the level two. And when the crash occurs and you reload all the data, you start from number three. So what should be here? Of course, it should be six. But in many frameworks, it's not like that. In many frameworks, the state is, is written every now and then. And when crash happens, the Kafka offset is written here, while the state is snapshot some point later. So here, it's after the crash, it's not six. It's not three, as it, we should, it should be. It's six. So then the window logic is broken, right? We didn't compute it accurately, and the window is just, just trash, right? You can't trust it anymore. But there are certain algorithms that can handle such, uh, that can handle such scenarios, and one of them is algorithm based on distributed snapshots. In your event stream, you insert from time to time certain points, certain watermarks that are used to, to trigger emission of uh, of saving state to some distributed store like HDFS and so on. And because they flow uh, in, in the stream itself, they are aligned with, with the messages. This is a little bit more complex than on this picture because you have joints and various different operators. But then you can, uh, you can achieve exactly once delivery guarantee. Of course, up to the point, as far as I think I, <laughs> I understood him in, in his talk, there's a problem of producers, right? Because even if your window is okay, and here you compute aggregations appropriately, then, of course, you've already wrote some of the hmm, some partial results to Kafka, and now you write it again. So it basically means your consumers have to be idempotent, right? This is the way you handle that. But even you have exactly one guarantee, even if you have nice producers, you still have a quite a big problem, and that problem are windows, time windows, because how you how you compute aggregation of like ten minutes of of tweets or or some user action? Well, you can use two different notions of time. One time is processing time when the event. Uh, when the event occurred into, in your streaming engine. And the other one is event time, when the event occurred really. So these times are pretty disconnected, and it's really difficult to align them. Because imagine we, we want to aggregate this tweet and this tweet together, but this, this, and this in, an, uh, in our window, and they arrive at our stream out of order, right? The order, uh, the order in, in our processing engine is on the x-axis, and the, in the event time order is on the y-axis. So this is, this is a really difficult problem, and one of the ways to handle that is to emit watermarks. For example, from time to time, we assume that at this point, mm, no event uh, with lower number than two will occur. And only at this time, this usually is done heuristically, like every 20 seconds or something like that. And at this time, we state, OK, no events will occur for this window, so we emit partial results. And in this moment, we say, OK, no more events will occur with, uh, uh, with, uh, with time later than 6, so we emit the window. But then the problem arises because some late events still may occur. So we have to handle it somehow. And the problem is that there is no one algorithm to handle that. Because each of the use cases can be different. It can be different for uh, there are different things that we may want from our engine to do with such late event. For example, we may want to discard it completely. We may want to generate new window just for this event, or we may want to try to glue it somehow to this proper window and adjust the result. 
So each use case can be different, and it's not, it, there's no one viable solution. Okay? So I hope I more or less made you feel that there are certain problems that won't be handled completely by Camel or, uh, or other generic solutions. Now, what are stream-specific solutions? Well, there's a plethora of them. In fact, a few more arise uh, after I submitted this call for papers. But now I would like to stick to two pretty new ones. One is Apache Flink. One is Kafka Streams. And just a two words about Apache being this is real new game in the market. But first, I want to acknowledge you about some certain distinction. And that distinction is between libraries and frameworks. This may be pretty obvious to you, but there are two two distinct categories that our solutions will fall into. One is library, when you, the developer, handle all the deployment stuff, dependency injection, monitoring, and so on. You made your own opinionated choices. And the library is just a small piece that does, uh, does the job. And on the other side of the spectrum, there's, there's a framework. When you have complete solution with its own choice of dependency injection, with its own monitoring solutions and deployment to Mesos, Yarn, and so on, and you just supply your business code. This is an important distinction because right, uh, reading mailing lists, I usually feel like some people tend to use frameworks as library, and they want to, for example, to, to, to run Spring or something like that inside of these stream processing frameworks. And that causes, well, I would say much pain. So first, we'll start with simpler solution, and that is Kafka Streams. How many of you are using Kafka Streams? Well, this is good because it's not released yet. It's a brand new feature uh, coming in Kafka 0.10.0. So it's a pretty simple, pretty nice library wrote by guys from Confluent who are behind Kafka. What's really remarkable for me is that it's less than 17 a thousand lines of codes. If you take different streaming solutions, then you'll notice that, for example, each, each, uh, each functionality like partitioning, serializations, and so on can take much larger amount of code than 70,000. 70, so it's really remarkable how much functionality they managed to put into such a small framework. So what's the vision? What's their vision? Their vision is that Kafka streams should be used not for kind of ad hoc analytic processing, but for backing up your kind of more crucial business processes that are developed by certain teams that they are aligned to, to the team which can handle the deployment, the, the release management, and so on. So they are mostly fitted for microservices. And they are another uh, important design decision is to focus solely on Kafka. So all these difficult things like serialization, partitioning, and so on, is done by Kafka. That means they can do only some, mm, some logical processing, and the APIs is simpler, and the code is really, really simple. And also, the one thing that is distinctive for them is trying to use kind of duality between tables and streams. And this is an interesting subject that I think deserves some mentioning, but. I think we won't have too much time for that. So Kafka, is, as I said, is a library. And each, the, the idea is that we deploy few instances of our code, of our microservice, with, with Kafka Streams uh, processing. And each of the instances is bound to certain stream partition. So that no partitioning occurs between the instances of our of our code, all partitioning and shuffling is done by Kafka itself. And the, the important thing is the stream table duality. And the guys from Confluent noticed it's kind of, if you think about it a little bit, it's kind of obvious fact that when you have stream of user updates, then you can make kind of a table of that. You can, the, 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 the stream of updates gives rise to, to the table of users, and each update on the user table gives rise to a stream of updates. So it may seem quite obvious, but there are certain APIs that uh, can, handle, can handle such processing easier. Okay? So we will have a short demo. I'll show you how it's working. Mm. There's, uh, 
No, 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 no. Okay. I'm not brave enough to use real, real time uh, tweet stream as, as uh, Taras did. But so, so we'll use some mm, artificial ones. We're generating messages and user updates, right? Do you see anything? Or not really? OK, I assume you, you see something. OK, so let's look at the API. How do we build this Kafka streams? Well, the, the basic point is called kStreamBuilder. And what do we do? We define a string. Here we define some mapping serializers, the serializers. It's not, it's not so crucially important because you have to configure it. It's just a boilerplate. And here we defined from which topic we want to consume. And then we can do some string processing. Of course, we can do uh, mapping, flat mapping, filtering, and so on. But we'll go to more more interesting subject. That is aggregation. So here, we want to count. Oh, maybe I'll just run the demo, and we'll see what goes in, into this string. So here in Cyan, there's a string of uh, of aggregated counts of uh, messages from each user. Like Taras made 13 messages, I made 12, and Jaeger made 14, and so on. So here we defined that we want to count the stream um, by key. And where does the key come from? It comes from Kafka. We don't define it here. It just comes from Kafka. So here we have to say this is another string. And this string tells us where the state is handled. And do you know where it's handled? It's mostly handled in Kafka itself. Kafka defines additional stream when the stream of updates to this our aggregation will be defined. And when crash occurs or we want to reload the process, then the messages will be replayed from Kafka. It sounds pretty, pretty interesting for me. I, 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 I I'm still remain to be convinced if it will work in, in large scale. OK, so we have this aggregated streams, and we write it to another Kafka topic. As you can see, we cannot choose where do we want to write it. It's always Kafka. Of course, we define the, the servers when the Kafka resides somewhere in configuration. I won't show you that because it's boring. Right, so this is simple aggregation. What about this stream duality that I was talking about? Well, this is, I will stop this demo, and I'll uh, run this one. So here, again, we, we have a stream of messages. And here, we have a stream of user updates. Here we define it's, it will be a table. That means that Kafka streams will define a, a stateful object by, by some Kaf, backed by some Kafka streams. And we can perform join, just like with SQL. Left join and in message, we'll add a user. And why would we want to use that? For example, for filtering that we are interested only in messages from, uh, from users with high ranking. Hmm. Is it working? Hopefully, we'll see somebody with high ranking. Yeah, so yeah, Taras is highly ranked user. And tweets for him will be shown. And tweets from me probably won't. Or Maybe so. So these are the basic functions of Kafka streams. There's also, mm, it's also possible to, to define some windowing operations, but I won't show you that. Why? Well, for two reasons. First reason is, of course, I'm running out of time. And the second reason is that Kafka streams currently doesn't support exactly one semantics. And I'm not pretty sure if it will. So as I said, when you have only at least one semantics, then window is a bit tricky to to use because windows can get uh, yeah can get uh, can get lost so there are also few things that cannot be handled properly by kafka streams and one is integration with non kafka systems you cannot just read twitter or write directly to hdfs or whatever and the other is kind of problems with scaling as i said all these kafka streams Instances are directly mapped to, to Kafka partitions, so it's kind of sometimes it's kind of a little bit difficult. I think it will be because I haven't used it. Of course, uh, it can be a little bit difficult to 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 move parts along. 
And also sometimes when you have many processes, for example, one of our clients want to have like 70, 80 fil different fil filtering process for, for different uh, streams of billing data, this notion of, hand, of having different microservices for each of, uh, of, each, uh, of each stream can be a bit daunting. So we'll move to framework solutions. And for example of framework solution, I've picked Apache Flink. How many of you have heard about Flink? Well, some of you, but not much. I didn't pick Spark Streaming because it's elephant in the room and everybody was talking about including including Taros and, and different peoples. So what about Flink? It's a pretty new framework. Well, it, it arrived at Apache like in two, 2014, and only a few months ago it reached 1.0 stage. But it's pretty mature because before it was in a research project in, in, I guess, in Berlin. And it also has some small commercial, commercial backup. So why did I choose Flink? Because, because it's, it can handle many diffi difficult scenarios that I've been talking about. It's low latency, it's, there are no micro batches, but going through, through each event at a time. It supports exactly one semantics just by the algorithm that I described. It can, can handle pretty massive states. I used it to, to, to handle state with like 20, 30 gigabytes on, on just two nodes, and it handled it pretty, pretty easily. I'm just backing up to HDFS. And it's also pretty, it also has pretty rich window API. So this is, this is really important. And as I said, Flink has a framework. There's this notion of global coordinator. It's called job manager. And there are workers like task managers. So it's more or less the same as, it's, as in, for example, Spark. And our code is just deployed into job manager, which distributes it to, to task managers to, to actually do the job. Right, and each task manager has certain slots of mostly mapped to cores that can handle certain amounts of load, and it's the Spark, uh, sorry, it's the Flink, uh, not Kafka or some other thing, that handle shuffling uh, and partitioning the data between different, different task managers. And the job of job manager is just to receive some certain updates, for example, state snapshots and so on. So this is how, how Flink handles, handles shuffling and partitioning. There are certain APIs that, that allow you to switch between different keys just inside Flink. In Kafka streams, it's not possible. If you, for example, have a stream of messages and you key it by message ID, and then you want to treat it as messages from certain users and partition it by user ID, then you have to go through additional Kafka topic, and here you can use it directly, which makes it much more complex framework, of course. So now we'll show, uh, oh dear, where am I? I'll show you a bit of the API. Where do I have it? We'll start with simple state demo. And here, of course, this, as you can probably see, this time it's not Java, it's Scala but the code will remain pretty, pretty, in fact, similar. So I won't set up a full Flink cluster, of course, but we'll use some local environment, just like for Spark also can be done. Oh, sorry. So what, what let's, let's close this demo, uh, this message. Oh, the message counter consumer went away, and uh, I'll just use... Mm. State them already. So we define our source against Kafka consumer. We defined how we want to parse messages to, to some case, Scala case class. And then, again, simple stuff like doing map, filter, and so on. All these frameworks resemble streaming APIs. We K, here we partition it by user ID coming from the message. And here we compute partial sums of, of one. What is one? Well, essentially one is, is first computing from zero, first field that is count in, in this message by user case object. And we write it again to some, mm, to some sync. This is pretty simple. We can do also much more elaborate state processing. Here we have it. 
For example, we want to filter out messages that are much lower ranked compared to compared to, to average rating of the message on the same subject. So here we have state processing. This is simple state function. As an argument, it has current message and maybe state. So this state, it can be object in memory, it can be written in RocksDB database and snapshot to HDFS and so on. And we perform some computation trying to, to see how, how we will if, if we want to emit it or, or not. And the result of the function is, on one hand, is a Boolean, should we emit or not. And there is a new state that will be written. And again, we write it into, into Sync Kafka producer. And what about Windows? Flink has pretty, pretty elaborate API covering different windowing solutions. And here we can define a window of time 10 seconds. And we can define some aggregation functions. For example, how, what do you want to aggregate? In 10 second batches, we want to aggregate which users posted, uh, posted uh, messages on certain topics. And again, we go into, we write it into Kafka producer. We can also define sliding windows and perform some much more elaborate computations. The code will be on GitHub probably, so we can have a direct look. I won't show you this time this, but if you think about it, the code is pretty sim similar to, to what is done in, in Kafka streams, if you look just at the API, but it's totally different because this code is not run as such. It's, it is just deployed into job manager, with, which deploys it into task managers, which handle them as they want. So in fact, there's a lot, lot more uh, going under the hood. OK, so there are many, many more ways mm, that you can configure Flink, like assign, assigning watermarks, timestamps. You can shuffle, shuffle the, how the data is flowing. You can adjust parallelism, and so on. And there are more, more and more things to come, like SQL API, driven by Catalyst. There are inter there's an interesting feature that is queryable state. That means that you will have access to the state for example, in memory, to, to perform some mm, real-time queries. In fact, you can do it even now, but you have to mm, use some pretty low-level hacks to do this. We do this to, to perform a direct querying of Windows in, by, by some REST API. But if you are not convinced about Flink, because Spark is mature, it has big community, and version 2.0 is scaling, there's another framework that is just creating just now, and that is Apache Beam. And what's interesting about it, it's, it's mainly written by guys from Google Dataflow, that is a streaming processing engine from, from the Google. And the idea is to prepare SDK that would, be, that would be common for different drivers, like Flink, Spark, Dataflow, and so on. So you would just use common API to write your uh, streaming processing, and then run it to, to at the engine of your choice. So I won't show you that because it's still not done. It's in Apache and Incubator, and it's still, I think it, there hasn't been any release of that, but I think it's interesting. And the API, again, it looks pretty, pretty similar to, to what the former APIs looked like. It also has very detailed API concerning, uh, concerning Windows, how do you handle late events and so on and so forth. But as I say, it's a thing for the future. So also to recap, because I think we're a bit running out of time, just a quick glimpse of how I'm thinking, how I would I decide which framework to use. If my stream is really big, like say more than 10, uh, more, more hundred thousand uh, requests per second, I would probably use some string framework like Kafka Streams, Flink, Apache Spark, and if not, probably I would use some generic solutions like Camel API, Hermes, or whatever. If I would need fast answers, I would probably use Streams, Flink, or other real-time processing thing. And if I accept latency by tens of seconds, seconds, then maybe Spark may be a good choice. If I want to use only Kafka as, as syncs and as producers and consumers of messages, then Kafka Streams may be a good solution. If not, well, Everything else can handle 
uh, everything, uh, all, all the frameworks that I told you about can handle also different things and, uh, and sources. And if you want to use Scala, well, you can use Spark Flink. And if you want to stick to Java, probably you want Kafka Streams or Apache Beam, which have Java API. But I think that today there's a talk how to use Spark with Java. So you can also try that. And there's one more important distinction. Who, who defines the rules? Is it more or less of analysts who, who wants to define them with some, I don't know, probably REPL or something like that? Or are they more, mm, more, more like business rules that can be deployed into microservices using your continuous deployment pipeline and so on? And in the former case, maybe you want to use string framework like Spark or Flink. And in the later case, Maybe you can try with generic solutions like Streams, Apache Camel, and so on, that you as a developer are more comfortable with. And the last three things that I wanted to, to tell you, to, to remember from this talk, is that first, really think if you really need streaming, a stream framework or stream library. Because there's a surprisingly large amount of use cases that can be handled by, the, by your normal, normal generic frameworks, like like, as I said, Apache Camel, Eka, and so on. It's the same with, with other stuff. Just by, because you, you have business process, it doesn't mean you need business, business process management system. And it's the same with, with string frameworks. The second thing is you know your context. You have to know what will be your problems. Will you have problems with Windows or with mapping your state of, of, with resilience or with, uh, or with uh, low or, or high latency? And only when you know what are your questions, you can choose the, the framework or library that will answer them. And the last thing is that we should really, I think, look deeper than the API when we assess those frameworks. Because if you remember the code from Kafka Streams and with, with Flink, in fact, the API looks pretty similar. Map, reduce, flat map, and so on. But it's, the difference is really under the hood. What happens when this code is run? And it has, can have tremendous effect on how your code is performing, how can you deploy it, and so on. And the literature, I don't give links. I don't give links because you won't remember that. But just remember, there's Flink block, there's jcribs block. This is the guy uh, from Kafka, and he's really smart. And there are two great articles from guys uh, from Google Dataflow, and they are called Streaming 1.1 and Streaming 1.2. And I think all these resources are really worth reading. Uh, they are pretty easy to Google, of course. OK, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Yeah, th this is a very quest good question. And when I wrote call for papers for this talk, I, I was thinking I'll mention Storm. But then so many things happened, and my project moved forward. So I think that Storm, hmm. I, I, I don't want to say that Storm is legacy, but its development, I think it's uh, much slower than it used to be. So things like handling large states, Windows support, and so on, are not too, too, too much developed in Storm. I think there's an there's, there's interesting thing, and that is some kind of fork of Storm done by, I think, Alibaba from China. And they rewrote it in Java, and it should be much, much more performant, and so on and so forth. And they want to contribute back. So maybe something will happen. But for example, Twitter, that is, I think, original author of Storm, I think it just ceased to use Storm by itself. And they made some their own framework with Storm API. I think it's called Heron or something like that. But as far as I know, they don't want to open source that. So it doesn't look that good. Because I tried to use Storm, but then we switched to Flink. And, yeah. and we're happy about it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but performance is, is not everything, right? We, are, we rather came to Flink for, for its API for handling state, right? Because we have quite large windows, and we just couldn't find out how to do it with Storm. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>